Okay, this is the, just uh, for the recording, this is the joint meeting of the Weber to see working group with the SCCG. Um, today is September 24th, 2024. Next. All right, uh, there's some other TPAC 2024 meetings which will be of interest. Um, sorry, Alona, uh, a lot I left off the SCGG meeting itself should have been on there, but we have breakout sessions tomorrow. There is actually an RTC real-time web track. Uh, and so we're three things uh, that are gonna go there. And uh, one of them is RTP transport. If you'd like to hear about this new API, which uh, isolates the RTP transport uh, aspects. Uh, please go to that. And we were going to talk about it in the Weber C meeting we didn't get to. So I guess we'll have uh, your status update there as well. There's an addition, uh, 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 Eugene and Eric will be talking about the evolved video encoding APIs uh, in a breakout session, as well as in the joint meeting, uh, which will occur later the week. And then there's also a sync on web uh, meeting, which is uh, synchronization of audio and video for new scenarios. So that should be interesting. And then on Thursday, we have our joint uh, meeting with the media working group. Um, Alad, do you want to talk about the SCGG meeting and when that's going to be? Yes, please. I think I might have put one here. So uh, basically, I would like to invite you all. Uh, if you're interested, on Friday, we're going to have another meeting. Uh, and then like the current meeting, which is kind of structured, there are presenters, there are presentations, and there is time assigned. Uh, on Friday, we're going to have something that's a bit more free, where people will just be encouraged to come up, pose, uh, you know, raise ideas, raise topics, and we can discuss. And we don't have to limit ourselves to just new uh, uh, web APIs and specs. We can talk about anything. We can talk a bit about, for example, the picking experience and the user experience. Um, for starting screen sharing, we can talk about audio, we can talk about limitations uh, that different operating systems present, anything you want. And of course, as normal, uh, spec issues. So uh, it's Friday, so uh, you can take a screenshot, you can take a picture, and you're very welcome to join us on Friday. So back to you, Bernard. Thank you. Uh, so go back. Okay. Uh, so this is today's agenda. Um, We'll start with dynamic surface switching, which is the one uh, where we see working group item. Then a lot will talk about captured surface control. Resolution of captured surface will be uh, talked about by Conrad. We'll go to element capture from a lot and then wrap up the next steps. Um, and we'll try to try to keep to time. We're four minutes behind, but hopefully we'll catch up. All right, next. Uh, I, I think you're all used to Zoom uh, by now, but the uh, only thing to note is this to get into the speaker queue, the plus queue and minus queue in the IRC channel. Um, and also if you're feeling adventurous, you can join in the browser and then you'll do web codex over RTC data channel instead of web RTC. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, and let's go to the next and hand it over to Toei. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name is Tove Peterson and uh, as I said before, I'm working at Google and today I will talk a bit about how we can uh, improve uh, the, the experience of switching between different surfaces when uh, screen sharing uh, on the web. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today's talk, uh, yeah, first, uh, this discussion on, on this uh, topic has been quite uh, long. And uh, so I think we've been going like two years at least on this. Uh, so, and this is like the link to the issue on GitHub. Uh, so, so today I think there's a lot of new people. So, so, so I will have more of like an overview of, of what we, where we are in these discussions, uh, give some background, and talk about like the two basic models that a lot of discussion goes around, which are the injection model and the switch track model, and uh, then a, a bit about the current state of this discussion uh, and like yeah where we are right now. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, uh, so. Um, so switching between different uh, capture surfaces is something that's quite common when you're uh, screen when you're presenting. Uh, you're first talk, discussing something, and then you want to kind of refer to some other material it might have been in the mother tab or window. And uh, so there are some vendors that have already started to add some functionality here for this. Like in Chrome, we can uh, choose to share this tab instead. And uh, Apple introduced in Mac OS 14 and a way to kind of change the window. This is on the OS level. Which, which window is currently shared uh, or, scre or screen. Uh, 
and this is something we would like to expand on and make a bit more smooth and like we would like to be able to, to switch between uh, the windows and screens and tabs more freely and, and provides a bit of a uh, better API for dev applications to to kind of know uh, kind of see what's going on and, and uh, be able to to react to, to changes in what, what the user is sharing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so injection model is the first of, of, of these basic models, and this is what we have, which is, sorry, yeah. uh, this is what, um, uh, yeah, what is used uh, both in, in, in Chrome for the tab sharing and I would say also on uh, this uh, Mac OS functionality. Uh, so the basic idea is that that when, when the user is switching to a new tab, uh, the, the, the new media is just injected in the ongoing media stream track. Uh, and this is mostly transparent to the application, so there's nothing, the application doesn't need to do anything, it just works. But uh, at, uh, at the same time, it, it doesn't really get any information on what's happening. It, uh, and, and it kind of works quite well for applications that are like agnostic to what is shared. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, if you go to the next slide. Uh, there are some some problems with this approach, and especially for applications that have a more like a more uh, intimate uh, interaction with with uh, what is going what, what is being shared. So so one thing is uh, that at the point where where um, where we're switching between the two different tabs, for instance, uh, if we want to also notify the client the, the application about that this is going on, there are some asynchronousity here that needs to be taken care of. Uh, we have the the media is, is uh, like asynchronous from from what is happening on the JavaScript thread. So if we want to do this properly, uh, we need to pause the media, then do the switch, and then uh, start the media again. And uh, there is also things that the application might want to do. It might want to change the user interface. It might, if it's uh, applying a crop target with a re with a region capture API. I mean, it's cropping out a part of the capture. This is something that we need to set up again. So there, there is quite a lot of things going on at this particular uh, point. Uh, a second thing here is um, that for, for like a high level tabs, windows, screens, uh, yeah, it's just media that comes, but there are different between these, these surfaces, especially tabs have some additional functionality that is not present uh, when, when sharing a window screen. So for instance, this region capture API, and there are some others uh, that is, that are only available when sharing tabs. Uh, so so um, uh, it, it's it's uh, important for applications to know when when these APIs are available or not. And and it uh, and uh, when doing the injection model, you have like just one media, ongoing media stream track, and then this kind of uh, track changes flavor uh, uh, while doing these changes. Uh, we have also think that web application may want to present these things differently, so it, it's uh, it become clear. This can be a clear, a bit muddled when when it's just one ongoing track. A third thing, problematic thing with the injection model is that if we start sharing video, uh, as the way API is currently set up, uh, it's a bit you can't really add audio as like in the next in the next uh, stage when if you switch into another surface. Uh, yeah, and if you know, go to the next slide. So the solution to this that, that uh, we have proposed is what we call the switch track model. And the basic idea here is that is, instead of having just one track that goes through the, throughout the capture session, uh, we, we provide a new media stream track for each capture surface. That's, um, and um, the idea here is that then each of these uh, these uh, Tracks which are connected to a surface, uh, they they will kind of they have a, a more invariance than, than when with the injection model that we have like it's the same type continuously throughout the lifetime of the media stream track. Uh, the same operations are supported throughout the lifetime, and and we can also be sure that when the frames that will come from a certain media stream track is is always guaranteed to come from that specific surface, and there's no like risk when we are doing this switch over that we kind of mix up where, where the frames are coming. So we, we don't need this, this synchron uh, that synchronization step that would be needed with the injection model at, at this uh, switch uh, event. 
And also the last one, the, the audio track is also something that uh, is kind of, it comes just automatically out of the, how this model works. Because when we, when we switch to a new surface, we get a new media stream and that can contain an audio track or not. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. And the API for, for this would be something uh, like this. Uh, we have a, a capture, we have this, uh, there's a capture uh, controller object and we can register an event handler on this object that uh, reacts to uh, a, a change of surface. And uh, then it, the application will do the setup it wants to do with this new um, uh, track or stream. So in this case, simple case, uh, we would just rebind the source object of the video element, for instance, to this new stream instead. And, and um, then this, is passed, this controller is passed into the Get Display Media call. Yes, next slide, please. So, yeah, so to be clear, the current state of discussion here is, yeah, this switch track model is kind of the, is, is a model that we, that we from Google propose as, as a solution. Uh, we would keep the injection model for the existing uh, surface switching between the same types that is kind of completely implicit, implicit to the applications. But then we think that for applications that, that uh, want to do with more around, uh, around surface switching, they can, uh, they can adopt this uh, switch track model and th then they get the cross type surface switching working in a way that, that we believe are easy to work with. And we will get this a bit better API surface for interacting with the captures. Uh, so, uh, of course, there are, uh, this, this is still an ongoing discussion here. And uh, so there we are not doing an agreement in the working group about, about this. Uh, so the, the current policy discussion is a lot around if we can somehow um, uh, retrain the injection model and also kind of expand it to, to be used for cross-type surface switching. Mm -hmm. And there's also uh, um, uh, a request or we call it, uh, yeah, um, I mean, there's also um, the opinion that, we, that it's important for applications to be able to choose a bit more freely between the injection model and the switch track model. Uh, uh, and that this is also something that needs to be possible to do exactly when we're switching, that, that they can, the place can choose if they want to, to inject the new, the new media into this existing track or you just switch over to, the, to another track. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. So the, the current framework we have well, we dis for that we discuss uh, around this is that uh, one solution here is that we provide both of these uh, types of tracks in parallel, we run them both the injection and the um, switch track model in parallel. Uh, so the it's up to the application, it can use these uh, surface tracks which are connected to a specific surface, or it it's also provided with a session track that co covers the whole um, uh, capture session, uh, and this is also still uh, a bit controversial. Controversial around certain details around this. So we have we have no we are not really landed in, in a solution here. But this is kind of where the, the discussion is right now. And for some details about this issues, is uh, you can refer to this uh, GitHub issue. Uh, this is still an ongoing discussion. Yeah, next slide, please. And yeah, that we are at the end. So I think that, uh, yeah, um, I will, like I said, look, look, open it up for, discuss, for if there are other people who want to, to add something here. Uh, so uh, a quick question for clarification, maybe. Um, so uh, when we look here, like, could you maybe say a couple more words about what the model, uh, uh, like, how would both models be supported in parallel? Yes. So, so um, yeah, this, uh, um, so, so uh, how would you say? Yeah. The, um, from, the, on the, from the top in the, in the diagram here, uh, you have the, the kind of a depiction of the tabs uh, that we are switching between. And uh, the blue squares are supposed to represent the media stream tracks. So uh, uh, the, the two uh, shorter tracks here is uh, connected one for each uh, tab. So the media is flowing uh, uh, through these media stream tracks. And uh, so we provide through an event, like with the switch track model, these are provided to the web application that first you get the first 
track, and then you get the second track. At the same time, these tracks are also uh, fed into the uh, like the session track. Yeah, and this is this is a bit controversial. How this should work exactly, uh, and uh, so the application would also have this session track available. So if it just doesn't really care about when, when switching occurs, it can just plug in the session track in the, for instance, uh, video element or peer connection, and then it's done and doesn't need to do anything more. Okay. So uh, that, that's kind of the idea. Uh, when you say in parallel, like, um, does it mean that we allow this or the other, or that we also allow both of them at the same time? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the idea would be to allow them both at the same time that, uh, in this model. Very, very curious. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't know. No, I just wanted to warn you as a Hello, thank you. chair. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on this because I, I think, Tilda, you made a good case for why this kind of session model is kind of complicated and also uh, potentially uh, a little brittle. Um, and so I'm wondering, it seems like doing both of them is kind of the worst of both worlds. Um, and particularly, we would have had a session had power not intervened where we would have talked about exactly uh, what goes into the track and for example, how the audio and video is synchronized and stuff like that. Um, and the splicing things together into that session track, it seems like it, it might be actually quite weird how, how that's done and you'd have to specify it. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to understand why absolutely we need both. Is it some kind of a back, it's a backward compat issue, right? Uh, yes, so yeah, I should have included some more code example here. Uh, so. To some extent, this is to uh, the switch track model is it's a bit more work. It's not much work, but it's slightly bit more work for, for the application to, to deal with. So it in some way, if for an application that doesn't really care about uh, server switching, it could be nice to just have this simple, let's uh, just call get the media, we get a track and then we're done with it. Uh, so it's a bit to accommodate uh, this, this opinion that has been raised during uh, like uh, various working group interim discussions during the year. Uh, so I think, I think that's primarily that. Uh, as I said, I think that from, from, from Google's side, we, we believe the switch track model is simple enough and it provides extra, I mean, it's, it, I think we feel that it provides a better API that, that is more, uh, it's more clear what we are working with and, and, um, and avoid some of the troubles with, with, with the injection model. So, so, so from Google's side, I think we would pre prefer to stay with that. And the multi-track model is a way for us to kind of see if we can find some compromise solution to kind of keep some of the, um, it, and it now is, 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 is a bit uh, backwards here, but so in some ways the, the multi-track model is a way to make things simpler for, for applications that doesn't really care so much. And, uh, and it, 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 it's at the cost of the, the, like the model as a whole is more complicated, but the simplest way of using it is simpler than with just the switch track model. Yeah, I guess uh, my question is when you got in, if you get into the details and actually look at what this kind of amalgamated track would look like, right? Um, you know, one of the questions we were going to get into is, is, for example, how how the audio and video would sync. Um, it's pretty clear to me how that would work with the with a uh, surface track model, but with a session track model, you know, with the the capture time wouldn't skip around, right? I guess you'd have to splice it in there so it's it's monotonically yeah. increasing, and then the but then the audio, right? It, would it all be aligned, or would it all uh, the capture times be aligned? Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of work to do in there to make it really a a legitimate yes. track that's seamless. Uh, yes. So this is uh, these are uh, details that need to be sorted out if we will go with this. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I fully agree with you that, that uh, uh, yeah, what should I say? Um, uh, so this is it's kind of try, a way to kind of reach a, uh, like a, uh, a compromise around this. But, uh, but uh, I mean, I, we believe that the switch track model would be sufficient for, for the needs. So, so this is like an ongoing discussion and I, I I'm not sure if I should have gone into this detail right now, but but it's kind of about where we are in the discussions in the interims uh, at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, think, next, yeah. Janiva. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, so thank you. Uh, so I had to dig back up my conversation, which goes back to April, I think. 
on this yeah. last we discussed it. So I think I remember now because I have the last comment in the thread. Um, so my, my feedback would be that uh, I think this is worth solving. Uh, I have a little pause about the separation of surface track and session track because it doesn't seem to match. Uh, it seems to be a, a, a bit artificial because you have to pick up front what you're interested in. And it seems to me that the problem space here is more like you start capturing a tab A and then you maybe switch to tab B. And at each point the user changes, there's a decision point, you know, should I keep injecting or should or do I need to switch? And it seems like, well, it's a diff tab B instead of tab A, might as well just do injection. And then, but then the user switches maybe from a tab to a window, or maybe they have a tab with audio. In this, this case, I get the on switch event as well. And then I want to make it a different decision, in which case, maybe now I want to uh, basically take the new, new tracks that I'm getting from the event and use those instead. But then uh, the subsequent switch after that could use injection again. So this di distinction between surface track and session track seems a bit artificial. Um, so the last sample, I, uh, like I can paste the link in the chat here uh, on IRC maybe. Um, I kind of proposed a, a surface. Uh, there was a long discussion, but if you look at the code at the end of that, I'm basically proposing that you register for a source switch event and you can use that to be notified. The first benefit is that you can be not notified of source switching, whether you intend to, to uh, uh, use surf uh, surface tracks or just rely on injection. So that's number one. And then basically you, you also have to stop some of these tracks. That's the other problem. So when you get this event, you can either choose to stop the old tracks and use the, because the event itself has, contains the new tracks, or you can basically make a decision right then and there by comparing the new stream. Does the new stream have audio? Does, it, does the old stream not have audio? And you can make a, a late decision on whether to use injection or um, the uh, switch, switch tracks at that point. So that, that was my last comment on that issue. And I would encourage uh, to continue discussion there. Uh, and I would hope that, the, so I'm more, I'm more interested in, in the API surface of getting the right API so that people don't forget to call stop, for instance, or that they get stopped into. Because with session tracks, once I go, uh, it's the idea that I opt into surface tracks up front yeah so, so that's that's one of uh, yeah uh, that's, that's one of the things that we that I think we haven't reached an agreement on, agreement on end yet that there are I think that I can see multiple options there and I think that uh, it becomes a bit we are kind of out of time already so I, th I think it become a bit more detailed discussions uh, and uh, I'm not sure if we have time to discuss more now or if we I should hand over to the next mm -hmm. some more people uh... need to so uh, you've not gone over time yourself, but unfortunately we started a bit late, which means the 20 minutes that were allocated for this discussion uh, are now over. And I would have loved to give you a bit more time, but then it might come out of Conrad's time. And I don't suspect that we will uh, reach consensus in the next five minutes. So maybe the action item would be to uh, keep discussing this uh, next interim. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, is anybody else uh, interested in saying one last thing before we move topics, maybe? There's a queue. Okay. Yes, so would you like to? Uh, but uh, if... Yes, that's yes. Felipe. Felipe. Felipe, okay. But uh, could we try to time bound it to the next five minutes? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can ask very quickly. Just uh, <clears throat> So my question was just looking at the API proposed there that looks like the new event is receiving a new stream. Uh, but why not just receive a new track on the same and the existing stream and reuse the existing add track and add um, remove track events that the app could use to to realize so, there was a change there? So are you now, uh, if, I think, uh, if you go back a slide or two to the, to the code example, uh, is, this, is this API you're talking about, Philip? 
Or is it was it the one that we also had? Uh, it hasn't updated for me yet. Yeah, oh. that one. Yeah, OK. So sorry, once, once again, I, I didn't fully get what you're asking. Um, yeah, so it looks like this is introducing a new event that, so the event contains a new stream with the new track. But there is, like, why not reuse the same stream, but just add the new track and remove the old track so that, you know, the app could use the existing uh, stream dot add track and remove track event listeners because those events already exist so that could be something used interesting i have no answer to this this is something that i yeah i don't know I think <laughs> it was, just, it was discussed. I might, yeah i might answer this one uh i think uh, it assumes a bit much that i mean you do get a stream from get user media but applications have a multitude of ways we don't really rely on streams that much anymore. And it's very common for apps to take apart these streams, take out the tracks and put them in a separate stream. So you can quickly lose track of... Um, Forget about the stream and just use the original the stream. Track. Yeah. yeah. Also, okay. also yeah. adding a new track, adding a new track to a stream that is locally being played, then you will actually play the audio that you're capturing. So there, there's, there's also some compat issue there. So it's just better to... Uh, to create a new 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 object like a new stream or a new tracker or whatever. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Ryan, you're next. Uh, yeah. So just to say that um, the injection model is is working because it, it has shipped already, um, and it, and it's working fine and it's it's good. So it's true that in the future, uh, when we add new features, um, like you switch uh, you switch track and then you have audio, we, we need to, uh, to uh, fix those issues. And um, except for the audio case, where I think we, we need to expose uh, something new, I think that all the other issues are, are solvable. So uh, Bernard, you, you mentioned some, some issues. Um, well, like it would be the, mostly for the audio case, right? And uh, that, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, like, there, there was a previous issue related to uh, not wanting uh, the video frame from the new source to actually uh, be uh, sent before you, you vet it. And so we, we have, I think we have, like, a solution for that as well with the uh, injection mode. Um, that said, the, the track mode currently with the, uh, just this event on your source, uh, this seems good as well. And uh, so I, I don't think it's, um, like having both model, uh, would be, uh, the worst, uh, of both world. I, I think it's, uh, it's okay. And I'm hoping we can, um, we can solve those issues that you're mentioning. So it would be great if you could, uh, write them down on, on GitHub, on the GitHub issue. And then we, we dive into that. And if we see that it's way too complex, then uh, we can always revise and, and uh, see how we can uh, move away from injection. But otherwise, I think it's, uh, if we can solve them, then it's, uh, it's good to keep the injection module, which is a simple model that is working great uh, for things like Media Recorder. And the switch track model, for instance, is not working great for uh, things like Media Recorder. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, thank you very much. Any um, Harold managed to insert himself just before the queue got closed. <laughs> just wanted to say that uh, we've been discussing this for quite a bit of time already. We have identified clear and deficiencies of the of the injection model, and we seem to have solution to those deficiencies in the switch check model. We shouldn't uh, block trying this out on on uh, achieving complete consensus. Uh, we should be learning from experience, not from theoretical arguments. So please make a decision. Go on. Well, um, I have the last comment on the issue in April, so I'm happy for someone to respond to that issue. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that. I think we're close to consensus section. Awesome. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Sorry to, uh, I have to cut this short, but we're 11 minutes uh, behind schedule. So uh, thank you very much, Tove.
And I guess the, the next action item is to keep discussing and uh, uh, hopefully reach a decision relatively soon and maybe start experimenting uh, uh, in code and learning from that. Um, um, for the for the notes, I think please uh, add a chair item to decide uh, what to do next if, uh, to move the discussion along. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, awesome. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to talk. I'm going to try to keep it brief, but I'm going to go over time myself because I'm starting three minutes uh, before I'm supposed to uh, be done. Uh, so it, I'm going to try to go fast. Uh, so reminder, what is captured surface control? So captured surface control is an API which allows interaction with the captured tab from the capturing tab application. Okay. So for example, let's say that you're using Zoom and you're using the Zoom web client or Meet or Teams and the user happens to be capturing another tab and sharing it remotely, maybe the user is still in the video capturing, uh, in the video conferencing application, but, and they want to stay there because they want to see the chat messages and whoever is at the, uh, be, uh, joining and leaving and other um, features that are built directly into the video conferencing application. Uh, but they also want to have some limited control of whatever they're uh, capturing. For example, maybe they're sharing um, a slides deck and they want to go to the next slide. Maybe they're sharing Wikipedia. They want to scroll down a bit and reveal a bit more of the text. Or maybe somebody told them that the video is not sufficiently zoomed, so they want to either zoom in or zoom out. So these are rel uh, relatively uh, innocuous um, actions that the user might want to take. And we uh, experimented in Chrome with an API that allows you to do that. So first, it allows you to read the zoom level and to set the zoom level, also list supported zoom levels. That was number one. And number two, it allowed you to scroll uh, vertically or horizontally at whatever point you wanted. Initially, we were thinking about page up and page down, but it turns out that that is not very well defined because when you page up or page down, it depends on what you're actually focused. There might be multiple scrollable sections of the application. So we went instead with delivering a synthetic scroll event uh, at the coordinate, desired coordinates. So the API shared before looked like this. Uh, you could uh, say send will, and you would basically, um, sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, there might be a small mistake here, but uh, forget about that. You would send will and you would say, okay, at X and Y, I want to have this uh, will delta X, uh, will delta Y. And uh, for zoom in, we had a couple of, um, uh, functions here, you can uh, read them later. And uh, we had uh, some concerns raised, mostly around the fact that uh, with this API shape, uh, you could actually uh, allow a remote user to scroll your screen, right? Like if the application channeled those uh, actions uh, from one user to another, uh, it might uh, support remote control. Uh, this was actually an intentional design choice uh, because we figured that this would be reasonable and useful. Uh, however, um, we've decided that this is out of scope. Uh, although there was some interest in it, it wasn't too major. So to make everybody's uh, time easier to accept this, uh, we decided to outright deny, uh, prevent this. So we've made a couple of changes uh, to the API shape. Uh, change number one is that instead of getting a send wheel, which could happen at any time that you had uh, transient activation, uh, instead uh, you call capture wheel once, designating a specific element as the element over which the, the local user is going to scroll. So for example, if you call capture wheel and you provide the video element, right, we, the user would scroll over that, and then the uh, browser would immediately see, ah, you're scrolling by this much at that offset and translate that directly into an action on the other side. <clears throat> so if I'm in meet and I'm scrolling over the video preview, now uh, the user agent is gonna uh, interact with the other tab and uh, make it believe that the user actually uh, scrolled that point. And because this would happen immediately uh, and all, um, and would only actually refer to trusted events, right? Uh, this is not something that you could actually uh, use to proxy anything from remote users. And I, when we spoke to uh, Mozilla and to Apple, and uh, I got the impression that this, uh, that we all agreed that this at least achieved that goal. And based on that, I, um, I suggest one more uh, approach for that. So for Zoom, uh, you could do something relatively similar by introducing, instead of having set zoom level, you keep set zoom level, but set zoom level cannot just be called at any uh, given time. 
instead you kind of had a set zoom uh, handler okay and you designate a specific uh, element so for example you could imagine that you set a particular button and you say okay this button if it ever experiences the on click event please uh, invoke this handler and the handler would then call set zoom level and the reason that this would be different would be that uh, you would first open a window of opportunity, but then you would invoke the handler. If the handler calls at zoom level, that works. But then immediately after that, you close the window of opportunity. And because of that, uh, you are guaranteed that it's only immediately after user interaction with the page that uh, Zoom can change and not four seconds later uh, because of some uh, input from a remote user. Uh, so... I could go into a couple of the details, but um, unfortunately, time-wise, I'll have to stop. Uh, what do you guys think? Um, sorry, before I uh, yield the floor, I just want to mention, UN and I have spoken uh, here during TPEC, and one of the things, uh, UN, you mentioned was that you kind of envisioned the user agent uh, providing some of the functionality directly instead of uh, via an API. And what I suggest is that um, there is a hybrid solution, right? where the application says, uh, if we look at uh, capture wheel, for example, uh, you call capture wheel and you designate a particular um, element. And then if the user agent wishes, it can show some kind of uh, user agent level UX that says, hey, to the user, hey, you could click here to start this interaction. Um, that's it. So uh, what do you guys think? Uh, who's on the queue? Hmm. Brian? Uh, just a uh, quick uh, comment on that. Um, it, it, we're starting to blend between, um, you know, actually having, a, you know, all the elements and interaction and everything in multiple places, just like we do with, say, Google Docs or any other thing. We're, we're talking about now having an interface that goes in multiple places. And I think that when you start looking at limiting something like that to just zoom and scroll and other things, uh, as an application developer, I'm going to think if if I'm going to use an API like this, I'm going to want to be able to do a lot more than that. And I almost wonder if it makes better sense to if we're capturing a tab to have an access to that window object so that we can open up a, um, you know, uh, a port to set, just post messages or something like that instead. And then all of these other things could be implemented, you know, without with just the code we wouldn't have to do anything extra we wouldn't have to have a, a new api as long as we knew what was the what was the window or document or whatever that root object is that we're capturing does that make sense um you said a couple of things uh, and i'm sorry if i didn't really if i don't separate them correctly but you mentioned post message uh when you post a message somebody needs to actually listen to the message and respond to it if i'm capturing wikipedia wikipedia doesn't currently have any code to actually listen to events coming from Meet or Teams or Zoom. Uh, so what's going to happen is nothing, and that's going to be uh, relatively frustrating. And you could imagine that this will never be adopted by 100% by of pages. And if we're even very charitable and imagine the 10% of web pages out there listen to these messages, well, it's going to be very frustrating for the user when the other 90% just ignore it. Uh, so post message. Post so the, now, just a second. if you the, mean, yes. If you mean that the user agent will then take those events and basically replicate them and say, aha, now pretend that the user actually interacted with the other page. Um, we have determined that that this would be too dangerous for anything short of uh, scrolling and zooming. Uh, I do have another uh, suggestion about how this might be done safely. Uh, you might want to look up something called Video Portal. By the way, the name has been reused by other people. Rather, I reused it like it was already taken. Uh, but if you look uh, for some Video Portal suggestion by me, uh, I do believe it, it would be possible to do something like that. Uh, but it's way too complicated. And uh, frankly, um, Chrome at least would not currently do that. Uh, there isn't enough momentum behind this. Understood. So just to clarify, the scope of this then is for the for web pages that are shared and to work generically with um, kind of like mouse touch events and that kind of thing, but without the actual clicking, that's not in the scope right now. Then just like the zoom, and I, that makes more sense to me now. Thank you. Uh, who's next on the queue? Uh, Yaniva. Uh, yes. So, uh, so yeah. Thank you, Elad. I think you've correctly addressed. 
the concern that I have. This seems to address the remote control use case. I'm sorry, I didn't see the issue that I see you opened it two weeks ago. I just uh, had a chance to look at it right now. So yeah, this looks good to me. Uh, maybe some bike shedding on the add set zoom handler, maybe uh, add and set and stuff like that. But uh, other than that, I think this looks like a good uh, good idea to me. I'm um, almost wondering if there's a general pattern here that we want to uh, get right and maybe reuse for other things. Because one of the things I kind of think we lost with transient activation was that the, we used to have stricter models than trans, and then we replaced it with transient activation, which is very loosely defined, you know, can up to be for, can be up to like several seconds. And there's really, we lost a strict association between a local action triggering something, which I think this achieves at reestablishing. So thumbs up for me. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Um uh, Sorry for uh, being a bit brusque uh, just the time, uh, but I'm obviously very happy that we agree. Uh, yeah, what's no. next on the slide? Uh, on the yeah. queue? Yeah, so I just wanted to check with the group that uh, to get on the record that uh, this proposal has addressed some of the security concerns that we've addressed so far. I mean, Yanni ever said it does. As far as I can tell, it does. Is there anybody who feels that there's something missing? Uh, Oh, uh, I forgot one comment. I see you queue okay. the task. Uh, I think you could even make this synchronous, so you can open the window of opportunity, call the call back, and then immediately close it. I think that should um, satisfy. Let, let's discuss that, but I think that we're generally on the same page, and we'll probably yeah. it's like this is purely technical. Uh, yeah. Let's go with that. Uh, I see Eric. <laughs> so, so can we can we put in? Can we put in the yeah. notes that uh, basically people in the room felt this addressed the security concerns? Uh, Thank you so much. I guess uh, no, ob yes. no objections. Okay, good. Uh, Eric? Yeah, yeah just a uh, question slash observation. I don't think a, a wheel up is a user gesture uh, that's often used with Zoom. Uh, so I'm wondering if your set Zoom API should work inside your uh, wheel uh, handler. You say that again. I'm not sure. Your Zoom API was tied to having a user gesture, correct? Um, is that so, Zoom? So uh, I don't remember what the previous uh, one was, but right now it would not be tied to a user gesture. It would actually be more tightly coupled, right? So you wouldn't even have the transit activation for four seconds, but rather it would happen immediately because as soon as the trusted event fired, uh, which would normally be immediately, uh, the handler would be invoked. And does a wheel up, wheel down event, is that a trusted? Yes, uh, if it comes from the user, yes. Okay. Uh, and um, you, you touch uh, on an interesting point, and that is that uh, scrolling is not normally, uh, does not give transient activation. Uh, so that bypasses that issue as well. Okay. What about in the iPad when you're doing that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we would have to check. But uh, if you're uh, if you're okay with the general um, approach, then I'm sure we can, <laughs> we can find out the details. So uh, uh, may the minutes record that you're okay with the. I think you provided my feedback. Uh, uh, it's it's okay, but it's not the the shape I I would prefer. I would prefer that the user agent uh, receives the the Zoom um, message and then forward it directly, and that. The web page would, type, would just say any Zoom that I receive. Actually, it's this big um, video frame that I'm displaying that should receive it, just like Capture Wheel. Um, I'm not sure I got this, but unfortunately, um, we're still no, over no, time. No, so. Just the user agent does it. So. Uh, no, it's just um, the web page says, hey, I want you to forward, but the user agent would be the one to forward. Yeah. yeah, just like for Capture Wheel, yeah. where it's I like that. Uh, for yeah, the Zoom. That's already the case. Like that's both our implementation as well as the thing. So when you uh, when you uh, uh, set Zoom, uh, the user agent uh, treats that as though the user interacted with the user agent on that tab. So as though in Chrome, for example, as though you went to the three dot menu and you know it's like found the Zoom thing and clicked plus. Like it's indistinguishable between. Yeah, the two. we're we're gonna have to move to the next topic. I think, or somebody's gonna lose their slot. Yes. Uh, sorry, Connor. Thank you. 
Yes, the resolution of captured surfaces, Conrad Hofbauer from Google. Next tab, next slide. So to set the context there. So a uh, web application like Doom Themes Meet limits get display media screen capture resolution using media track constraints with and height. Um, they do this to conserve system resources and to adapt to where we sit on that resolution quality bandwidth trade-off triangle. Um, and the resolution of the surface that's actually shared so of the tab or the window, the monitor, is relevant in this trade-off decision also. Um, and with the resolution surface dimension here, it's both the physical resolution is important. So how many pixels are this on the screen also, but also the logical surface dimension. So how big is that um, surface in terms of resolution independent pixels? So what do I mean with logical surface dimensions here? Next slide. Um, for a lot of people, it might be obvious. For those who isn't, I'd wanna go into it because it's important for this context. So let's say we have a, an operating system uh, that doesn't have resolution independence or rating or a high DPI support. So if we have here three screens, which are the, the same physical size, let's say these are all 27 inch screens, but different pixel resolutions, one is 1080p, one is 3K, one is a 4K screen. So if an element is defined here by the sizes of stuff, let's say fonts or a button is defined by how big is that? in terms of pixels. And that means if you get more to the right here, the more higher resolution the screen gets, the smaller stuff gets. So every sharpness stays the same, but everything gets smaller. Um, and this, with this really high resolution screens, this became a problem. Next slide. So that's why the operating systems nowadays, all of them have resolution independence, which means the size of stuff is actually um, based on a logical resolution that you set in the settings. So even though my same three screens here now have different physical resolution in terms of pixels, there is a concept of a logical resolution which defines how big the size is. So with higher DP screens, stuff doesn't get smaller, but it gets sharper. Now this logical resolution, 1080p here, for example, in this in this example, but the user can really set that what he, where he wants that, is a good indicator or proxy for how big or small things are on the screen. And that's why important in, in capture then also. Next slide. So this is how, how this is done in the different operating systems. Um, on Mac, you directly set that logical resolution. Um, on, on Chrome OS, you move a slider and you get a percentage. What's the percentage difference between physical and logical? The logical one is usually smaller. Um, and on Windows, you, you set a scale percentage there. Next slide. So if we capture a surface there, there are really four resolutions involved there. Um, so the first one is the physical width and height of that captured surface. So how big is that window that I'm capturing in terms of pixels on the screen? Second one is the same thing, but in logical pixels, as in how big is that in this resolution independent pixels? Third one is the, uh, the constraints, the width and height that sets through media tech constraints. Um, that's an indication what the application would like to get in terms of resolution. Um, and the last one is then if on the track I call get settings, I get this meter track settings object, the width and height there. Um, so this is what we actually get then in the end from the capture on the track after, after the constraints have applied. That's important there. Next slide. So today we have the last two things, the constraints and what we actually get. But next slide. We don't have these up these two things up there um and what i'm aiming at is we would like to have these things we would like to know these things next slide so the problems to solve with the api proposal that's about to come is we don't know the physical resolution of the thing that we're capturing 
once a constraint is set and then for example, the window at tab gets resized because what we effectively get back is the constraint resolution. Um, we also don't know the logical resolution. Um, you might think, hey, we have device pixel ratio and window screen width, but these are all things about uh, the, the screen on which the application tab runs on and not about the thing that's captured, which might be on a different screen. And then what complicates this even further is that um, we might have up-rendering tab capturers. So a tab capturer that says, hey, if you have a very small browser tab that you're sharing that's only 300 pixels wide, I actually give you a bigger resolution than what's in there to make this look better. Next slide. So the proposal is to exactly expose these two things, um, which then allows us to address all the all the before mentioned problems. So of the captured surface of the window tab or the monitor that I'm, that I'm sharing, what's the physical width height, what's the logical width height. Next slide. So what would this allow an application to do? For example, an application, the web app could say, hey, I want to capture and send at the, lo at the logical resolution. So even though if this is a 4K screen, the user set log logical resolution to 2K in the operating system settings, that's what I want to capture and send at. Because in resource constraint scenarios, this is a good trade-off. Um, things are still readable at this logical resolution, um, but I don't blow bandwidth and, um, and, and CPU on getting that super crisp last crispiness that one gets out of the out of the physical resolution. Another application might want to say, hey, I want to do two spatial quality layers, one at the logical resolution for the reasons I said above, and one at the physical resolution for, let's say, a peer coding scenario where we really want these super crispy, um, super crispy fonts. And the receiver picks based on bandwidth and desired render size. Third application would be, hey, I want to choose as an application um, a resolution based on content, based on the content of what's shared. So if this is more spreadsheets, text with very small details, I want to do physical resolution. If this is dynamic videos where I would rather spend my bits on, uh, on the complexity of the content, um, uh, because so much is changing all the time, I rather want to just do logical resolution. And last but not least, it gives us good control over these up-rendering tab capturers, um, where just that example above where I said, hey, you have a slide deck which you want to share, um, but you have it only in a very small window in a tab um, because, hey, you don't care about this, you care about the meeting, and but you still get it, put it on very good resolution on the wire. Next slide. So, Implementation details. Yes, next slide. So this will be the proposed API changes that we add these things as instance properties on the meter track settings of shared screen tracks. So you do to get display meter, you get a track. On the track you do get settings, and then you have the other meter track settings, which are really properties of what you're getting and add their captured surface, physical width and height and captured surface, logical width and height. And in order to that, the application doesn't permanently need to call get settings to pull this all the time, also add an, uh, to, to find changes, also add an event to the parent uh, object on the media stream check that a hey, captured surface dimensions changed. Next slide. Yes, so I think this would be a really good thing to have. It would give the application much better control to adjust how the constraints should be set. Um, the question is, do we agree? Which opens up the discussion. Yanni uh, is on the queue. Uh, yes, so uh, I think this is a good use case, and I agree with uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me, the, the property is exposed. Um, I, I kind of disagree about putting it on the media stream track itself, because if I understand correctly, these properties are properties of the capture itself. And also media stream track uh, is used for many sources, not just a screen capture. So I'm wondering if they could go on the capture controller instead. And then we could also put the event on the capture controller. Would that work? Yes. Yes, we had internal discussions on that also. So capture controller is certainly an option there. Um, pros and cons are that uh, capture controller today is, on, is today only a Chrome thing. Um, and that would be then you have some properties on capture controller and some on, uh, on the media stream track. So these are the, the trade-offs we make there, but it's certainly an option to put this on the capture controller also. And Google, and Google would be fine with that also. Mm. Excellent. Because uh, I think normally media stream track settings are part of the triad of constraints and capabilities and settings. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it would work better on the capture controller. Mm. Uh, you're on next. Yeah. Um, so I, I like, uh, I was actually saying that I like it in settings because it's uh, easy to implement. It's there. And uh, there's already an event which is on configuration change that is there so that you would not need an event. It would just be two fields in the settings dictionary and that's it. Otherwise, it seems, uh, it seems an, a, a good addition. I have no objection with the addition. Uh, Brad, um, just wanted to point out that the, uh, and that and maybe this is covered by the settings change event, but there are um, many devices that use a mix of of uh, logical pixels to, to physical pixels, and they can also change midstream, and that happens uh, somewhat regularly, potentially as there's even with like power changes and things like that. So you know, as long as there's an event or something, other than that, this all looks good. Yes, so that's what we have the event. And where this happens very often is if users resize their windows. So if you capture a window and the window gets resized, then this also changes in front. Yeah, I was going to ask about some of the privacy aspects of this. I mean, essentially, I think you could probably figure out what monitor somebody has. I don't know. Is, do you have a response to a ping comment? I mean, today, if you don't, if the application doesn't set a constraint, um, then in practice, you get the physical resolution um, if you capture the screen. So, and it's anyway guarded by all that flow, I think, through the right. screen sharing dialogue. I mean, you need to allow how I'm sharing my screen the content to be able to get. So the there's picture. essentially no new surface that's created by no, this. I don't think so. This is negated by the fact that the user has approved of sharing something and you're already getting like a user's entire screen or something. So to just get the resolution, which is, you know, relatively commonplace, there are only so many uh, models out there uh, and they're all kind of, of relatively similar. Sure, there are a couple of very unique uh, screens, but most of them are relatively similar. That seems very much less information compared to the actual pixels currently on the screen. Your next slide. Uh, yeah, I uh, wanted to ask you, and um, could it be that there is actually benefit to having a distinct event? Because you know, as an event comes to show more and more changes, it means that whoever is listening to that event needs to now go and check many things. Okay, what has changed? Yeah, maybe. So I think that maybe, uh, like, I would personally prefer it on the controller. Uh, because I think, like your neighbor, that it uh, fits better with the mental model of like this is what you're capturing. It's not the uh, stream of frames that are coming in; it's the actual thing being captured. And having a distinct event means that uh, processing it is going to be a bit more, um, uh, more efficient. Maybe yeah. I, I mean that's my uh, my preference, but it's uh, it's not blocking. It's a very small preference, and so, your your argument is also. So, so okay. So, so um, uh, would I be correct in reading that you would be fine either way? Uh, yeah, I would not block uh the event in capture controller. Yeah. 
uh, and the so, prefer, and this and the uh, properties too. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's either one or the other. Yeah. yeah. So so long as they're in the same place, you're fine with either. You've got a preference for the settings, but the other one works fine. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, we're getting so, this in the notes. Sorry, not to jump in, but uh, I thought you and made a good point. If we could actually reuse the existing event, I might be okay with it on the media stream tag too, not to just totally be floating here, but uh, I'm also <laughs> wow. flexible. So, okay, so if I withdraw my own opinion and say that I've changed my mind, uh, do we have consensus? <laughs> <laughs> I think there is weak consensus for either. So uh, I mean, then it's yeah. toss a coin. Yeah. We can, we can okay. say that there is rough consensus on that. Yeah, there's consensus on the feature. And the feature. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the API shading. more to the side. Well, the API shading. On the trend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mark is next. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a good idea. Um, from an implementation point of view, um, it seems like the application might be most interested to know the new height width after it is stabilized, because if there's a rapidly animating element being captured or someone resizing the tab, um, by the time they apply constraints based on the event, the actual size may have changed again. So um, having some, like kind of knowing when it's reached a stable state might be interesting or more useful for applications that want to consume the event. Yeah. But I think just no, having more implementation experience would help determine that. There's the same issue with configuration change as well. Yeah. And we should solve it. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be good to have a an issue on the bug tracker. Yeah. And uh Yanivar. No, sorry, I, I dropped. I'm good. Okay. Uh, so uh, as long as we've got the consensus and notes, I think we're good to move to the next uh, topic a lot. What do you think? Sure. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, let's see how much time I have. Um, let me okay. try to go a bit fast, but yeah, not track. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about, oh, sorry. Oh, no. Okay, I missed her. So um, element capture. Uh, so a quick reminder, element capture is uh, an API that allows you to take uh, a track a video track where you're already capturing the current tab using some, you know, pre-existing means, right? Like get display media, one day get viewport media. However, you end up capturing the current tab. Uh, you can now change that into a capture of a specific element uh, or subtree of the DOM on that uh, uh, that is in that tab. So, for example, in the screenshot that we see here, uh, we see the uh, demo page. You are all uh, welcome to, uh, to go and uh, check it out. But basically, there is um, where we take the capture of the entire tab and we um, transform it into a capture of just the blue uh, element over there. And you will see that it magically raises both the uh, occluded content, which is the green uh, box. And there was also, uh, you know, the uh, partially occluded content of the red box that if you uh, that you can see pokes through the blue one but not in the capture right so if you look at the bottom where the actual red blue and green are you can see a bit of the red box uh through the blue box but in the video element that shows what we're actually getting from the capture afterwards it's gone uh so i want to uh do a very short case study of one way that this is used uh in google meet okay so in google meet uh, one thing that we have recently uh, shipped is uh, called Meet Add-ons. And with Meet Add-ons, you take a uh, third-party application and you just iframe it directly in Meet and you can use it. And other users could potentially also iframe the exact same application. And some users might not be able to do so, maybe because they're on mobile and maybe that was not developed yet. Maybe they lack the uh, credentials to actually load the application or log into it. Or maybe you're actually inside of the application, you're presenting or you're interacting with some user-generated content that's strictly yours and you've not shared it with anybody else so they cannot load it. So what you would do in such a case is you would go and you would pre press uh, share and you would capture the current tab. You would then restrict that capture to only the iframe and then you would be transmitting that remotely so that users who cannot load the content uh, can see it too. Now, what Element Capture gives you here is that even if there is something part of the meet application that draws on top of the captured third-party iframe application, 
uh, that does not end up in the capture. And that is actually very nice for privacy, right? Because you don't need to worry about whether some private messages happened to be drawn on top of the, uh, in our case here, it was Figma, right? So if I get a private message that happens to be uh, inside of Meet, right? That's not going to get captured and uh, shown remotely. If there is some kind of interruption, uh, like for example, a drawdown list, that's not going to cover the content, not going to prevent uh, remote users from reading it and understanding it. Uh, if there are notifications that say, hey, do you want to allow X into the room? That's not going to get captured. That could be a uh, private too. So basically, uh, the application doesn't need to do any extra work to make sure that things are always laid out in just such a way that nothing would get leaked. It's the browser that actually guarantees that it's only the iframe that will um, uh, that will get shared remotely. And that's really good. So in our case, the interaction with the iframe application is uh, you interact with it as comfortably as though it were part of the embedded application, but you share it as though it were uh, as privately as though it were part of a completely separate tab with no uh, leakage of information in between. And if we continue the case study here, uh, Meet actually uh, released an SDK that allows third party applications without too much interaction with Google and without too much engineering effort uh, on Google's part to uh, allow themselves to be iframed by Meet and to join the Google work, uh, Workspace Marketplace by having some kind of add-on that can then uh, be offered to Meet users. And that's another way that they can get users or uh, you know, uh, provide value to their own existing users. Uh, so uh, I think I've already covered this particular one. Now, one thing to note here is that um, in that way, Meet is actually um, element capture actually benefits the web or benefits the smaller players because there is no extra work that you need to do. So, sorry, um, like we can imagine that if Figma wanted to provide this without element capture, right? Like maybe we would need to do some kind of complicated integration by which remote users would still be able to load one time, you know, my if I wanted to show my Figma thing, maybe they would get some token that would allow them to one time load that and get access to it, but only during the call. And then as soon as I ended the call, they would stop being allowed to load that and it would be complicated and time consuming and uh, expensive. And then probably Meet in this case would be limited in how many such collaborations it could have. But because we're just using element capture here, it just works. So you don't need to set up such, you just share the things that you are allowed to actually load. Uh, so in that way, smaller players are actually not locked out of the market, which is great. Uh, so obviously, uh, new, new proposed APIs are not uh, just great. They are also concerning. And some concerns that I would like to address here. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to Yanivar and to Martin for providing feedback. Um, and I want to dissect part of the feedback that I got. Uh, so, Yanivar, you mentioned that uh, we need to consider two cases. Uh, there are malicious uh, applications where basically, as soon as they get any kind of information, it's too late, right? You said that they detect, eject, and that's it. They have your info. Um, in that case, I would say that I completely agree, but in those particular applications are not becoming more capable of launching such attacks because of element capture. Uh, so, it doesn't matter. And then the second type of application that you uh, noted were those uh, mainstream tracking libraries. And here uh, I disagree with the feedback because I think that tracking libraries generally avoid APIs that prompt the user at all. And even if they were willing to prompt the user, I think they would more go for geolocation or something like that that's relative, it seems innocuous and then gives them a lot of benefit. Whereas with Get Display Media, that's going to show a very uh, complicated dialogue that very sus. Uh, dialogue, and then even if the user were to interact with it and choose to share something, in order for element capture to be part of the story here, the user needs to share the current tab, which is very unlikely, right? So, and in any other case, element capture is completely irrelevant. So because of that, I think that um, element capture does not change the story from that perspective. Uh, maybe you've got other criticism of the API, in which case uh, we can discuss that. Uh, second is uh, Martin, 
uh, you said that you think it would be trivial, uh, possibly even trivial to uh, for the embedded application to basically left, just so you know. Okay, sorry, but uh, what Mark? Thank you. Uh, so what Martin said, and unfortunately he won't be able to uh, contradict me now, but maybe Anivar could uh, uh, stand in for him. Uh, so Yanivar, uh, Martin said that it would be possible for a third party for the embedding in the embedded application to basically replicate this thing uh, without capture. Uh, I think specifically thought about Google Docs and Google Meet. And I think that this is too narrow a case because if the same company owns both of the uh, uh, both of them, then yeah, sure. In that case, you could do something. But once we go to uh, you know two uh, two applications that are um, not do not belong to the same uh, company, then suddenly it becomes a lot more complicated, and all of the arguments I mentioned before uh, apply, especially the ones about smaller players. Uh, so apologies if uh, things were a little bit um, confused, but uh, the time pressure got to me. Uh, I want to say that the conclusion is that Element Capture is a useful API and its experimental deployment in Chrome has been a success, from my, uh, in my eyes at least. Uh, Element Capture does not increase malicious actors' power to harm the user. Uh, obviously, if anybody disagrees, uh, you can explain why. Uh, my basis for this claim is arguments that I've made, you know, over the last two years, not uh, not in the last 10 minutes, uh, but also the fact that Chrome privacy and security experts allowed us to run the origin trial is proof that they were convinced uh, of the valid validity of our own arguments, and they do not do so lightly. Uh, last, um, so I think that element capture is generally a good thing, trademark uh, for the web, because it reduces engineering costs and uh, makes collaboration between different applications possible and even trivial, whereas otherwise they would be very difficult to achieve. And because of this cost, certain collaborations would not be pursued, especially those between a big uh, application and a relatively small application. Uh, and now, please tell me how everything was wrong. <laughs> I, who's first on the queue? Uh, uh, yes, so, so uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, to give some context, uh, uh, th thank you for including the link uh, for my comment there so people can read my comment in context. Which uh, is yes, the, the link is there. Yeah, the standard position issue number uh, 857. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but element capture, it's not just iframe capture, right? It's any element. Mm -hmm. And uh, it still allows capture of occluded content, correct? Correct. Yes. So, so that was the context for this comment, and why Mozilla is not in favor of the API because uh, capture of you know, premise of uh, it's true that a lot of the existing um, uh, vectors of get display media, there's a lot of stuff people can do already but it requires flashing things on screen or doing overlays that are semi-transparent or something that is at least remotely visible. And I know Elad would say you could do it semi-transparent where people can't see it, we can still read the data. But the thing is that that's not the same as openly capturing occluded content. And the comment there about detection is that detection is, can often be too late, that was point one. And the second point was that if, if you can do things in the dark where things are occluded, then we have to worry about not just malicious, openly malicious websites, but also tracking libraries uh, that once they can get away with things and not be detected in any way, then tracking libraries suddenly might feel that they can do that. Whereas before they probably wouldn't risk it. Like a tracking library wouldn't risk a get user media prompt, for example, or a permission prompt. So um, I would encourage uh, Element Capture to follow the lead of Get Viewport Media to implement the cross origin, origin isolation. And I think uh, if we have co-op and co-app, a lot of these concerns um, go away. And I think that would change our opinion on it. So Yanivar, did I answer correctly? Um that if we only allowed element capture to run on tracks that were to, uh, obtained using get viewport media, that would be a reasonable approach in your eyes? That would be okay for me, yeah. 
I think okay. because then you have uh, the well, uh, you know, it's not a zero concern issue because you can still read information from local rendering. But uh, personally, I think, just speaking for myself, uh, I think that's the main. That would uh, be the main issue for me. Yeah, once once you can isolate the page so that the malicious page can't bring in. Um, uh, you can still bring in iframes, but they're either credential less or they require cork. Uh, and I think that's much better from a security perspective. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to repeat this again just to make sure that I got it correctly. I don't want to put any words in your mouth. But what I'm hearing is uh, if uh, element capture only works for tracks obtained using get viewport media, Mozilla would after some debate of uh, specifics, support this API. Did I get that right? Well, I can't speak for all of Mozilla, but uh, you know, I, I think that that has a good shot of going through. Yeah, we'd have to check with Martin as well. Okay, thank you. Who's next on the queue? Me. Uh, so I, I hadn't looked at this deeply before. The occlusion and not showing things on top that you don't want to uh, make sense. I was curious, has there been any feedback uh, from sites that may want to say, I really don't want the user to be surprised by you know things that aren't visible to them showing, so please crop it or otherwise blank out those regions that are occluded? Uh, blank out, no. A crop it, there is another API called region capture. And one more thing to note is that you cannot accidentally use this uh, API, right? Like you, you have to explicitly choose to do so. And let's say that you're an embedded site within an embedded site. Like you you already are guaranteed that your own occlusions are not going to be erased unless you mint exactly that restriction token that would allow this to be, uh, so to be magic erased. So you're basically in control. You are either a, a document that's already in con or that's in control, or you're already being controlled from outside because it's not your own occlusions which are being erased. So you never had a say. Does that answer your question? I think so. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Maybe me. I don't know. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I would generally echo uh, Yonivar's. Uh, that's what I said yesterday as well. Uh, so the, the concerns and potential solution. Uh, the second thing that came to mind when you represented again uh, this was that you mentioned that it's very hard uh, for a website to always keep um, what is being captured, uh, not being occluded because there's a menu bar and so on. And um, I tend to agree, but I wonder with uh, there's not the possibility for a CSS property or something like that so that the user agent would actually do that for a web page so that the web page, the web developer would be free of uh, optimizing too much this because in most cases I would guess that uh, this occlusion in the, the use case that you're presenting is happening like uh, for uh, a very limited amount of time and it's uh, it, it, it's it's not that much uh, bigger deal to actually um, change a little bit the, the rendering uh, to, to prevent occlusion. Uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, and I would say that if you imagine this screenshot, but a little bit, you know, it's like in a different resolution, you would see that the drop down list would actually have no place to go except for over the iframe, in which case uh, that CSS property would either misfire horribly or has to have to be ignored or have to suppress the uh, drop down list entirely. Uh, so while I'm very far from being a CSS expert, I to me that does not really sound viable because just thinking about how it would work without the underlying implementation details, it sounds undesirable. I don't know. Uh, and also think about uh, that in this case, there could be things that are intentionally drawn over the iframe. So for example, private messages, right? Maybe those just drift uh, on the left side of the screen. Uh, we've got something called emoji reactions. They're not terribly important, right? But uh, um, where else are you going to do them? Like, it's part of the uh, look and feel of the site. Do you care about these things being captured or not? Well, generally, uh, you would prefer not to. But in the case of emoji reactions, I would say probably not the most terrible thing in the world. Messages, yes. Uh, drop down lists that block the user from seeing things, yes. 
And you can imagine that if we go beyond the case study of me, right, like we're, we're not only uh, interested party here, uh, you could imagine websites in which you start playing out a music, uh, a video that's iframed, and maybe it's not your own video player, maybe it's a YouTube player, and at the same time, you already get some tools to already start interacting with the next slides or something next that you're going to present, So, and you've got limited screen real estate, so you kind of need that space. So I, I can imagine a lot of different sites that would intentionally want to to cover something up while still sharing it. Um, Yuena, is, did I hear correctly that you like uh, like any of our that if we subjected this to the same limitations as get you viewport media, you would support this or at least not blow? Um, well, again, I, I should uh, talk with colleagues, but uh, that's what I said uh, yesterday. Oh, it's, it's, for the minute, it, it seems like a nicer. Uh, a nice addition uh, to to prevent things to to go bad. And you, in your case, the iframe actually wants to to to, to be integrated. So it's clear in that case that they will try to uh, abide by these rules to to be uh, mm -hmm. to to be captured um, uh, nicely and even if being occluded. So it seems that it fits your uh, your actually end goal and your your application model. Okay. Um, just for, I just want to make sure that we uh, uh, thank you, and uh, just want to make sure that the minutes capture this correctly and uh, not uh, over optimistic. Okay. Uh, who's next on the queue? Uh, no one. Okay. And six yeah. plus three. Well, we actually made it to the end of a meeting without a power failure, so that's a plus. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. The first for us, uh, and I think we're uh, done for the day. Any other closing words, Elad? Um, no, just uh, for those who joined a bit later, I just want to remind you that we're going to have another meeting of the Screen Capture Community Group on Friday, and um, this will be a much more open for participation kind of thing, less structured, where people are encouraged to bring up their own ideas, and uh, just so we know what kind of interesting problems we might want to tackle next. Uh, so uh, if you are not otherwise engaged, please join us on Friday. And uh, you can reach out to me if you need the link. And the link is also on the main page of the Screen Capture Community Group, uh, which is w3.org slash community slash SCCG. So, uh, and you can find the a link to the details there. It's the latest uh, post. Yes, and I'd like to remind everybody tomorrow we're having the real-time media track, so uh, three hours worth of presentations there should be pretty interesting. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you next on Thursday at the Joint uh, Media uh, Web to see Working Group meeting. Thank you. Thank you for taking notes. I think I managed to look. Yes. Can you unplug me, please? Yeah. <laughs>